is episode 11 of Ionia, and for this episode I decided to invite Joe Schmidt to join me as my guest co-host. Uh, before we get into it, Joe, do you want to talk a bit about uh, yourself and the kind of work that you do? Yeah, uh, thank you for having me on here. I'm, I'm really excited for this. So I study philosophy at Purdue University, uh, and I do both scholarly and popular level work in philosophy. So on the scholarly level, uh, I write and publish papers uh, in peer-reviewed journals. Uh, and on the popular level, I have I make lecture videos and host discussions on my YouTube channel, Majesty of Reason. I've had lots of really cool philosophers on, and I also run a blog by the same name, Majesty of Reason. So with that, I think, uh, with the good news, having mentioned the good news, I think we should kind of get on to the introduction of the whole position, since the book is focused on substance dualism. So let's just start with the first question. What do you mean by a substance? Well, a substance is a thing, a constituent of the universe or the universe itself. It's... um. Uh, it's such a general term that it's best illustrated by examples. Um, my table is a substance, the earth is a substance, um, disembodied spirits are substances if they exist. Um, anything that has properties uh, but um, isn't an event um, uh, and uh, but who's having those properties constitutes an event uh, is a substance. I think that's a fairly clear notion. Uh, substances can consist of other substances. The desk can consist of a top and a number of drawers and so on. Um, and uh, uh, that's what substances are. They're things that have properties and they have properties at particular times. And so if the soul is a substance, it has properties. Yeah, so that, that kind of bridges us into the, the mind or the soul and asking uh, sort of what that consists in. So can you give us uh, a rundown of what you mean by mind or uh, soul, as you use the word? Uh, I, I avoided the word mind because it's used in so many yeah. vague senses. Um, uh, uh, soul, well, that too is used in a number of senses, but it's used in a pretty clear sense, both by Plato and Descartes and also by a lot of ordinary people uh, to mean um, uh, an, a part, uh, a substance, which is a part of me, but is not a physical part, um, and not an extended part, that's to say it doesn't have a certain uh, uh, volume, um, and um, uh, it's uh, uh, what makes me me, uh, or rather substance dualism is the view that it's um, an essential part of me. It, um, without it, I wouldn't be me. Um, and the particular form of substance dualism that I'm defending um, is that it's the only essential part of me. Um, substance dualism may hold, as it were, but both bodies and souls are essential. Um, and uh, uh, in, in a certain sense, Aquinas held that. But um, uh, Descartes held, and I hold, that uh, the soul is the one and only essential part of me. Though, of course, I do have other part, another part, my body and all that it's made of, but uh, uh, that's not essential for it being me. That's the doctrine. Yeah, I, I wanted to ask um, about um, the reason for writing the book. Now, it seems to me that the most common complaint I receive from dualists is that uh, the treatment of dualism is kind of summed up in textbook interactions and then leaved off at that. So uh, was there any particular reason like reaching out to a more public audience in writing the book? Well, why another book on dualism? Um, well, I have written quite a bit about dualism before, you're quite right. And in some ways, um, what I have to say here are on basically the same, the same view, but I've uh, added some details, some further arguments. Um, and also I intended it as, as a, a, a more popular book. Um, that's to say my last book, um, in this area, mind, brain, and free will, 
was only one that really a professional philosopher could uh, come to grips with. Um, but I wanted the, this to have a wider audience. I'm not certain I've altogether succeeded in that, but it, it had a, as a, <laughs> succeeded in making it as accessible to the general public as I would like, but I think it is more accessible than mind, brain and free will, and I wanted that. And um, so uh, to make it more accessible, uh, to tighten up the arguments in certain ways, uh, to spell them out a little more clearly, and to make uh, several further points. For example, I've never discussed Descartes before, um, and um, uh, I have a, a chapter saying why I think basically Descartes was right. Um, and uh, that's uh, worth saying because it's a pretty unpopular view. Um, and uh, so those are my, my motivations. So with that, let's move on to the arguments for dualism. So uh, the divisibility argument, or you know, some people call it the modal argument, um, you can roughly understand it as it is conceivable that one's mind might exist without one's body, uh, any material thing, or at least any that is a candidate for being a thinker, uh, is divisible into parts. Uh, but no thinking thing could be divided into parts. Uh, the very idea of half a thinker or half a mind seems to be absurd. Uh, thinkers, ourselves included, must therefore be simple and hence immaterial. So um, that's kind of Ashcan's summary that I was uh, just kind of articulating there. Do you have any clarifications or additions, uh, Richard, uh, for the audience? Uh, no, but I think I can explain why um, uh, it's inconceivable, as it were. Um, uh, this is an, an argument against partial identity. Um, uh, I think we ought to go back one stage, that is to say, almost all the uh, attempts to deal with the problem of what makes a person at one time the same person as a person at a later time, uh, say that, well, it's a matter of bodily continuity or you know, continu having some of the part bodily parts of the earlier person and mental and or mental continuity, being able to remember some of the things that the uh, earlier person did. And the immediate problem is uh, uh, how much of these things, um, it's entirely arbitrary. And um, uh, it, it looks as if any analysis on those lines would be arbitrary. Why 50% of the body rather than 20% or 80% and so on. Uh, and also there is the problem that if you have slightly low standards, that is to say, uh, the person has to have, the later person has to have 40% of the body in order to be the same person. Well, there could be another later person that had 40% in there and they can't both be the same. So uh, at that point, um, the more fashionable view these days is what I call a par par partial identity theory. That is to say, identity of persons to do it is the matter of degree. Later persons are somewhat the same as earlier persons, uh, but not entirely. And as and this view is uh, very fashionable, Parfit, Nozick, um, and uh, others have adopted it. And uh, uh, actually, it might sound a bit plausible, but it runs into big problems. And the big problems are, are really uh, the ones that you originally alluded to. Um, and okay, well, if partial identity is possible, um, then uh, it ought to be possible to divide a person into two so that at any rate in some respects and some bodily respects, there are two people, one of whom has some of the body and some of the thoughts and the other of which has the other part of the body and the other of the thoughts. Um, and indeed, for any theory of personal identity, that must be the case that it is possible to set that up, because unless the, you require 100% continuity, there will always be the possibility of partial continuity. All right. So if somebody, and I called uh, 
this person, um, uh, what did I call this person? Um, uh, Alexandra um, is uh, divided into two, or rather her brain is divided into two, and half is put into one body, and we call that Alex, and the other is put into another body, and we call that Sandra. And uh, the suggestion is both of these persons are partly identical to the earlier Alexandra. Now, what does that consist in? What is it for them to be partially identical? Well, after the analogy of material objects, if you uh, uh, use, a, use a, a table to make two tables and you use uh, the top to make one cat table and uh, the drawers to make another, then it, it, it's uh, uh, the, each of the persons would have part of the Alexandra and that would mean part of her brain and um, perhaps part of her memories. Uh, right. Um, and so um, there would be these two persons, both of whom are partly Alexandra. Now, what would it mean for them both to be partly Alexandra? Well, if Alexandra knows in advance what's going to happen, uh, Alexandra can reasonably expect that at any rate, to some degree, she will have all of the experiences of each of them. Uh, otherwise, there wouldn't be. Uh, and um, one of them may be horrific experiences. She knows this thing, uh, that um, Sandra is going to have some horrific experiences, and she knows that Alex is going to have some marvelous experiences. So she can expect to have mixed experiences. But of course, no one person does have mixed experiences. So that can't be what a partial identity consists in. Well, perhaps it consists in part of uh, Alexandra uh, having one of the experiences and part of Alexandra having another of the experiences. But that entails that the original Alexandra has two parts who uh, each have different experiences, but, um, or they, they may be sort of qualitatively identical experiences, but there are two parts in uh, the original Alexandra, one of whom can go one way and the other can go the other way. But that's just not the case. Um, each of us has only one part in the sense that all our different mental events are co-experienced. I experience seeing you, I experience hearing a noise out of the window, I experience touching the desk and so on. There's just one source here. And um, so the, there isn't a part of me that can go one way uh, or and a different part that can go another way. Um, there's only one me. So I can't give any sense to it being the case that uh, a later person can be partially identical with an earlier person. And therefore, if I'm right about this, therefore uh, it will follow that um, one of the people, at least <laughs> one of the people, sorry, at most one of the people, possibly neither, but at most one of the people can be the earlier person. And yet being the earlier person doesn't consist in having some of the same body or some of the same mental events because that becomes arbitrary to where you draw the line. And um, the only reasonable thing to say at this point is um, the more uh, some later person has of the original person's brain and the more the later person has of the original person's memories, the more probable it is that the, that person is the earlier person. But being the earlier person doesn't consist in having a certain proportion to run into those difficulties. And therefore, uh, being the earlier person is something over and beyond what the evidence is. And the evidence is brain continuity and uh, memory continuity. And that's the way that the argument goes. 
Yeah, it seems, seems to me that pretty much the force of the argument relies on a kind of Neolockian view of persistence of persons during time. And that takes psychological continuity to be essential. So what are your thoughts if we, for example, regard biology as Eric Olson does to be what tells us what happens during these cases that, you know, people, for example, or their left hemisphere or the right hemisphere is moved. So we would be animals in that sense, organisms. And when the um, another person receives my left hemisphere or my right hemisphere, I would be still me, but they just receive a part of this organism, like a um, liver transplant, for example. So what, what are your thoughts on, for example, animalism? Do you think... Um, this will change things? Well, a animalism, uh, as um, Harry Horson puts it sometimes, is we are human animals. Now, of course, I don't want to deny that. Uh, at any rate, for us on Earth, we are human animals. But the question is, what makes, because we've all got bodies, what makes us um, who, who we are? What makes us that particular person? And um, well, we certainly do need more, more than, than a body. Um, uh, uh, if the person's dead, but uh, the body is still working, that's, that's not the person. A dead person isn't a person. <laughs> so being a person, you know, would be contingent, but the animal would be persisting. So, for example, when, you, when someone is in a vegetative state, they do not have any mental um, activities, any mental continue, any psychological continuity, but they are still that person, right? Uh, well, maybe, maybe not. Um, uh, if by uh, degrees of vegetative state, but if you mean by vegetative state connected to that body and that brain, there are no conscious events, no no mental life. Um, then it seems to me it's a bit of a matter of arbitrary, a borderline case, a bit of a matter of arbitrary definition, whether there's a, whether there's a person there or not. If there's a person there, it's certainly the original person there, but if there's a person there, it must be revivable. If it's not revivable, then the person's dead. Um, once again, what counts as revivable is a little borderline. No, nothing takes, nothing turns on that. I mean, if you say it must be revivable by in a certain way, and um, they're not revivable in that way, but then, then a bit later uh, that they're, they're conscious again, uh, you can say either well, um, he was there all the time, uh, but. Um, um, it needed uh, certain things to revive him. Or you can say he died and we brought him to life again. It's um, pretty arbitrary what, what, you, what you say in that regard. Um, um, after all, when we're asleep in a dreamless sleep, um, we don't uh, uh, consider that uh, the person has disappeared, but that's because it's easy to wake them up. Um, and because we have reason to believe because of their uh, particular brain states that from time to time they do have conscious experiences. But if that's all gone, and if it's not possible to revive, then the person's gone. And if some like, bits of the brain come to life again, then the question arises, well, is it the same person or not? And um, once again, you weigh the evidence. I think at this point we might just um want to shift gears and uh, I want to touch on an issue that's related to a lot of these kind of modal arguments for dualism that um, yeah so the 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 point that I want to touch on is called mitigated modal skepticism so this will take some spelling out so I'll do that and then um, I'll get to my question so many philosophers this van the van in wagon Yes, yes, yes. So many, I was just about to say that. So many philosophers like Peter Van Inwagen, uh, Philippe Leon, and so on, they've defended a view that has come to be called mitigated modal skepticism. Uh, and the view kind of pertains to the scope of our modal knowledge, that is, our knowledge of metaphysical possibility and necessity. And in particular, and, you know, roughly, 
Uh, the view essentially says that um, a significant degree of skepticism or intellectual humility, if you want to put it in a kind of more positive light, um, is called for when it comes to possibility claims in domains that are far removed from our ordinary humdrum experience. So defenders of the view, they have a variety of motivations for this kind of view. So I just want to, for the listeners, spell out briefly four. So first, uh, as Kripke and others have taught us, uh, many metaphysical necessities are only knowable through experience and like scientific investigation, right? Like we just simply can't access such modal facts from our favorite armchair via imagination or conception. And given that there are many such hidden necessities, as it were, uh, it seems, so these people argue, uh, the mitigated modal skepticist, it seems that we should not be confident that conceived or imagined scenarios beyond our humdrum experience uh, do not involve hidden metaphysical impossibilities. So that's one kind of motivation. A second motivation is that many, if not most, imagined or conceived scenarios that are even modestly removed from our ordinary humdrum experience are such that when we flesh out the details, they, they come to be when we flesh out the details, we come to see that they are metaphysically impossible, or it's not clear whether they are metaphysically impossible. So for instance, a lot of these people say that, oh, well, you know, I can conceive or imagine of an iron bar floating on water, say. Um, but given the densities involved and given the nature of iron and water that we discover a posteriori, um, that's simply metaphysically impossible. So that's the second kind of argument. A third kind of argument is um, uh, that they say that a kind of permissive freewheeling approach to modal judgments about possibilities admits of way too many false positives. So, uh, you know, they could say, what about Goldbach's conjecture? Um, like we can, so these people argue, we apparently can be able to conceive of both its truth or its falsehood, or at least a successful proof of its truth or its falsehood. Uh, similarly with the modal ontological argument for a necessary being and the reverse modal ontological argument, which have incompatible, but equally well conceivable or imaginable possibility premises. Um, moreover, some people might say like we can conceive of ourselves existing without our brain, but also we might be able to conceive of ourselves being identical to our brain. And since identity is necessary, the possibility claims involved um, would, would seem to be incompatible. So that's a third uh, uh, motivation. And then finally, a very, very briefly, um, they, some authors argue that there's little to no explanatory connection between modal facts way beyond our humdrum experience and our beliefs about said facts, um, and that this lack of explanatory connection kind of undermines our claims to knowledge in these domains. So for instance, um, Timothy Williamson, I believe, and um, also Nichols, uh, they both argue that the ability to reason about nearby but not remote possibilities is conducive to our survival in virtue of giving us the ability to like evaluate risks and, and opportunities, um, like for instance, by mentally simulating counterfactual scenarios. So I'm, with these kind of motivations sketched and with the mitigated modal skepticism in mind, uh, Richard, how do your kind of arguments for dualism engage with this mitigated modal skepticism? Like, do you think it, it poses a serious challenge to many modal arguments for dualism? Or do you think this challenge can be like um, overcome? Well, uh, skepticism is easy. One can be skeptical about absolutely anything. <laughs> question is whether it's rational to, to be skeptical. Um, I am prepared to admit that I may be wrong about almost anything except, as Descartes said, my own existence and my current thinking. And so, of course, for that sort of reason, I may be wrong about this. But uh, by reasonable standards of whether one is right or wrong. I think uh, I've got a good argument and nobody's got a better argument by a long way for the other side. Right. But in order to deal with your point at length, um, we're going to take out, uh, take up quite a bit of, of this uh, debate. Um, and uh, I'm quite willing to do that. But um, uh, I'll just explain to you why. Um, it all depends, or a lot depends, on what you understand by metaphysical possibility. Um, when I was young, um, there, there was only one kind of really hard possibility, and that uh, was usually called logical possibility. And a sentence or the proposition which it expressed uh, was logically possible, if and only if, it didn't entail a contradiction, and it was necessary uh, if its negation entailed a contradiction, and it was impossible if it entails a contradiction. And this, whether it entailed a contradiction or not, 
was something that if you understood the sentence, um, you could start working out. And um, of course, there may be a hidden contradiction, as perhaps, though I'm not so sure about that, your iron argument uh, suggested there may be a hidden contradiction uh, somewhere. Um, but uh, with regard to a lot of sentences, it's pretty obvious whether they do or don't entail contradictions. Um, and so we have a lot of our priori knowledge of what's logically possible and what isn't logically possible. And we know how to set about uh, discovering uh, whether something's possible or not. Um, you discover whether it's necessary by seeing if its negation entails a contradiction and conversely to show it's possible requires a little more effort and uh, the usual way of doing showing that some sentence is uh, logically possible is by seeing whether you can sketch a scenario in which, uh, in which that sentence would be true in other words whether you can suggest uh, a fairly obvious uh, logical possibility which entails that sentence and that, of course, is what uh, I am giving you an a priori argument uh, for um, it being uh, for some of these matters. Um, and, uh, yeah, some of these matters. Um, now, then uh, Kripke and uh, Putnam came along and they said there are some necessities as hard and as uh, logical necessities, only you can't work it out by uh, merely knowing words. And that exists because things have hidden essences and the essences make them what they are. And if you don't know what the hidden essence is, then you will say that something is uh, so and so. Uh, and it may not be because its hidden essence is different and the famous sort of examples uh, given. I'm sorry to go through this, but it, it is necessary. Um, uh, sort of examples famously given is, is water. Um, Putnam's example. Uh, you see something is, um, we pick out things as water because they are, um, it's a liquid in our seas or most of our seas and rivers and it's transparent and drinkable, and that's how we pick it out as water. But, says Putnam, uh, the way, what makes it water isn't all this, it's what it's made of, and that are, that is to say, uh, molecules of H2O. And for that reason, uh, we may sometimes misidentify something as water, uh, or we, um, uh, so, um, while, um, it's, well, uh, it is in fact necessary that water is H2O, although uh, we can't, uh, people for the 19th century didn't realize this. So there are necessities arising from the essences of things. Okay, um, but these are our posteriori metaphysical necessities. Right. Now, what's the relation between these necessities and uh, logical necessities? Well, I think it's a very simple one, and that's this. Um, uh, the um, supposed metaphysical necessity, water is H2O, is equivalent to a logical necessity and its conjunction with uh, a, a logically contingent proposition. Uh, the logically necessary uh, principle is um, kind, something like kinds of liquid are the liquid they are in virtue of their chemical essence. Well, okay, <laughs> you can define uh, kinds of liquid that way if you want, uh, people have generally done, done so. Um, and the uh, contingent proposition is uh, the properties of being transparent and being uh, uh, um, uh, drinkable and being found in our rivers, uh, 
being found in our rivers and seas are uh, contingently reduced by um, uh, molecules of H2O. Um, and um, uh, that might not be true, but it is true. And uh, so that's, that's what makes it metaphysically necessary. And I have developed a more general theory of this matter when we are dealing with um, uh, what I call underlying essence <laughs> metaphysical necessities, that is to say, um, uh, water is really H2O um, because of its underlying essence. Um, uh, then um, uh, something is metaphysically necessary or possible or impossible, if and only if, um, when you substitute for the referring expressions in the sentence, you, what I call uh, informative designators for what I call informative designators, uninformative designators, you get a logically necessary proposition sentence. Sorry to go on all this, but <laughs> it's, uh, you know. So, what do I mean by an informative designator? An informative designator is one such that if you know what it means, you know what it refers to. An uninformative designator is if you know what it means, you don't necessarily know what it refers to. Um, the tallest person in the room, the highest building in London, uh, these are uninformative designators because you would understand them perfectly, yet not know who is the tallest building on earth. On the other hand, many of the property words for uh, picking out individual uh, properties, uh, observable properties, um, are informative designators. Um, something to be square is for something to have this shape, and you can see it. Uh, it's, uh, to be spherical, for something to be a door, it has to be like this, and when when you push it, does this. In other words, opened it, um, and um, you wouldn't know what a door was unless you could recognise it in this way. You wouldn't know what spherical was unless you could recognise it in this way. And there are also um, names of individual things like this. Um, the Eiffel Tower, just if you wouldn't know what that was unless you could recognize it when you see it. Um, or rather, I then have to qualify. Something is an informative designator, if and only if um, you <laughs> can recognize when something is or isn't it, if you are, if your faculties are working properly, if you are properly positioned, and if you are not subject to deception. And subject to deception is a matter of um, something looking not the way it normally looks in paradigm circumstances. So of course, someone may think they're looking at a square when really they're not because they're looking from a distance that, or their eyes aren't working properly, or uh, there's some trick of the light or so on. But nevertheless, um, and likewise with the Eiffel Tower or London or whatever. Um, sure, uh, somebody could make a mock-up of London and try and pretend you it's London, uh, or a mock-up of the Eiffel Tower, and that's deceptive. But given that your faculties are working properly and so on, uh, you'll recognize it. Okay, so applying that back to the um, Walter's H2O example. Uh, oh, sorry, and I should say something is, just to repeat my definition, an informative designator, if and only if, under ideal conditions, you can recognize uh, whether it's a case of it or not, with your faculties working properly and your ideal position, or it's defined in terms of other words of which that is true. All right. Now, water is H2O. Uh, 
water is clearly, for the reasons we've already got into, not an informative designator. Um, um, you can call something water uh, and be badly uh, misinformed, even though your faculties are working properly and so on and so forth. Um, but H2O is an informative designator in my sense, because although we can't, as it were, our eyes aren't quite the right uh, uh, sort to spot it straight off. Nevertheless, the definition is, um, is in terms of things that are ultimately informative designators. Um, it's made of molecules, uh, each of which um, are made of two atoms of hydrogen and one atom of oxygen. Um, an atom of hydrogen is defined as one which has uh, one um, proton in its nucleus, and uh, um, uh, oxygen is defined as something that has eight protons in its nucleus. Uh, protons are very small particles, um, and um, uh, the uh, proton is defined in terms of its mass and uh, in terms of its charge, and it's 10 to the minus 15 of something, and 10 to the minus 15 is defined in terms of 10, one tenth, 15 times, and um, uh, uh, so on, you can get a definition ultimately in terms of things you can recognize. Um, okay, so uh, my contention is, and uh, I have begun to argue that in one or two papers, uh, including initially, of course, Mind, Brain and Free Will, and also in an appendix to chapter five of, of this book, uh, Are We Bodies or Souls? But um, it's very important for understanding uh, those metaphysical propositions which are of the underlying essence kind. That if you substitute for them, uh, refer the, for the referring expressions of properties or substances in them, any uninformative designators, and you substitute co-referring informative designators, you get a priori, that is logically necessary propositions. And, okay, <laughs> well, uh, so there's nothing deeply mysterious about metaphysical necessity of that sort. Uh, on the other hand, of course, uh, philosophy has uh, taken off in a direction very strange to what I was used to as an undergraduate. People are p postulating all sorts of wild metaphysical necessities of the world is absolutely full of these things and they, uh, they are not a uh, priori, but they detect, they force the world to have a certain shape and they're just as necessary as a priori ones. Um, and I see no reason in general to believe that at all. Uh, this is, is just wild uh, philosophical speculation. I can understand these uh, metaphor, these, the ones of the sort I've talked about, because um, you, know, you can understand what you're saying there by saying it's metaphysically necessary. Um, it is that um, um, <laughs> the substance you in fact pick out by water has a certain characteristic. Okay, I understand that. And all the other ones, all the chemical ones, or Hesperus is phosphorus, they all fall into the same pattern. Um, so I, I'm happy with that. I don't see any reason to believe there are any other sorts. And given all that, then when we come back to are we bodies or souls? My ultimate contention is, of course, that the word I, or my own proper name is referring to me, is an informative designator. And so, um, and not merely in virtue of being defined, but in virtue of my ability to recognize myself in ideal circumstances. That is to say, when I'm a subject of 
conscious thoughts. And um, that being so, uh, we've got the proposition, I am now thinking, or I am now the same person as such and such a later person. Um, there's no deep metaphysical necessity uh, here of a sort we can't detect because all the referring expressions are informative designators. Either it's a priori possible or whatever, or it isn't. And uh, <laughs> that's the only sort of metaphysical possibility could hold. So that, though I've gone on rather a long time, I hope this has been comprehensible. Um, uh, is uh, my answer to the Van in Wagen scenario. He's right that some of the things that philosophers suggest might be logically necessary, uh, and oh, for all we know, dot, 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 um, couldn't be uh, 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 metaphysics, sorry, could, might be metaphysically necessary for all we know what, what, couldn't be metaphysically necessary in this sense. And I see no reason to believe that anything is metaphysically necessary unless we can show it in this sort of way. So, <laughs> Uh, we've taken up a lot of time on that, but that is the move. And it is very important, actually, because uh, um, a lot of wild speculation around uh, uh, is open to criticism on those la lines. We simply uh, couldn't understand some of these things. Um, awesome. Thank you for the answer. Um, definitely useful. Um, one, of, one other thing which dualism focuses on is its explanatory power. So imagine knowing all your information that you want to have of your interactions of physical properties. But when someone asks you, okay, could you explain consciousness for me? You might draw a blank. So one of the advantages of dualism uh, is argued uh, to be its advantageous fact in explanatory virtues. One of these points is uh, conservation laws and substance dualism and its explanation. So, Joe, do you want to take this? You know, you were pinpointing some potential explanatory advantages of um, dualism in accounting for, you know, mental phenomena that seem distinct, at least from the kind of particles bashing into one another or excitations of quantum fields and whatnot. So that's that's what a lot of dualists say might be explanatory advantages of substance dualism. But my question now might be uh, a potential explanatory disadvantage of substance dualism at some um, physicalists level. And that is, of course, um, the potential tension with conservation laws. And so this will probably be the, the last thing that we cover for our, uh, our discussion. But um, so on this, well, I guess the basic problem uh, is that, hey, given our conservation laws, it seems as though um, energy cannot be created or destroyed. And moreover, if we take uh, conservation of momentum laws, it would seem as though uh, the brain and the various momentum, momenta of the particles and neurons and neurotransmitters and so on, it would seem as though you have a complete and sufficient um, a kind of physical explanation of that because uh, there's, there's no room for a kind of impetus or insertion of either energy or momentum or change of direction or any of these sorts of things from without, uh, from outside the physical system in question. And so they argue that might potentially um, violate, uh, dualism that is, might potentially violate these conservation laws. Now, I know you address this, uh, Richard, in your book, but uh, philosopher David Gunn, I think that's his name, I think that's how you pronounce it, um, in a recent 2021 article entitled On the Ultimate Origination of Things in a Philosopher's Imprint, he defends a kind of conservation type argument against substance dualism. Uh, and so I just want to briefly uh, spell out his exposition of the argument. And then he also addresses um, what you, Richard, say. So I, I kind of just want to get your take for the final thing that we do in our discussion. I want to get your take on his response to your response. Okay, so here is a brief quotation wherein he spells out the kind of the, the problem. Okay, so I'm quoting from pages eight through eight to nine. <clears throat> it's just one paragraph. Newton's second law of motion states that the change in the linear momentum of a body is proportional to the force impressed upon it, while his third law states that for every impressed force, there is another force of this kind, which is equal in magnitude, but opposite in direction to the first. It follows that the change in momentum induced by the first force is equal in magnitude, but opposite in sign to the change in momentum induced by its reciprocal complement, and so on for every pair of reciprocal impressed forces. 
In other words, these two changes exactly counterbalance one another so that there is no overall change in linear momentum. The total quantity of rectilinear motion is therefore conserved, which is what we set out to show. An analogous dynamical argument holds for curvilinear motion. That dynamics enables us to explain the conservation of the total quantity of motion in a merely physical way, implies that there could be no immaterial contribution to this quantity, contrary to substance dualism. Okay, so that's his, that's his quotation. And so he then goes on to consider um, your response to conservation type arguments. So this is, again, just one more paragraph that I'm going to read. This is his response. So uh, Gunn says, in his recent defense of substance dualism, Swinburne, 2013, pages 112 to 115, attempts to circumvent conservation arguments from classical physics by claiming that in quantum physics, Heisenberg's uncertainty principle implies that the conservation laws hold not strictly, but only statistically. However, as we shall indicate, analogous theoretical demonstrations showing that the conservation laws hold strictly also in modern field theories, including those of quantum, quantum physics, reveal that Swinburne is mistaken on this point. Heisenberg's uncertainty principle pertains to the appearance or measurement of physical things, as Swinburne acknowledges. But if the uncertainties it denotes are to make room for the interaction between material and immaterial substance that he envisages, they really need to pertain to physical things as they exist in themselves, something that the conservation laws strictly obtaining and the deterministic evolution of the wave function preclude, end quote. So I'm wondering what your assessment of uh, Gunn's critical engagement with your response to conservation type arguments um, against oh, substance uh, uh, All what I need to invoke at this point is not substance dualism, but property dualism. Uh, there are conscious thoughts. The world consists of them. And <laughs> there are sensations and thoughts and uh, uh, intentions and beliefs and so on. They happen. They happen more obviously than the physical world happens. And pretty clearly, a lot of them are caused or and partly caused by goings on in the brain. So, and also it's pretty obvious that no physical theory has the slightest ability as things are at the moment to explain why that is the case. So no physical theory can possibly be complete. Um, so it's no good appealing to a physical theory to show it in, in this area. Uh, because it's so manifest that it can't deal with these things. Uh, it's so manifest that going on in the brain does cause pain and does cause somebody to have a certain belief in so, um, And given that, um, well, uh, things have effects. Clearly things in the brain have effects other than the effects which are a matter of more of more particles colliding with each other. And since it goes one way, there's no reason to suppose it wouldn't go the other way or couldn't go the other way. Even if you were right uh, that the brain is a deterministic system, the way it would have to work would be that the brain caused some uh, pain or whatever. And um, uh, uh, simul I guess, uh, uh, simultaneously cause some other going on. And so uh, it wouldn't be really, as it were, the pain that caused the going on, it would be, be the brain of it. Uh, and of course, um, some physicalists uh, do adopt that view. But um, uh, Firstly, it doesn't seem like it. We, we agonize about a decision, we take the decision, we put it into operation. It looks like there's a downward uh, 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 causal route from our thoughts and feelings to um, um, in the motion of our hands. And clearly, we don't affect the motion of our hands directly, it must be through the brain, so, so, so down to the brain. Um, but then, of course, the uh, physicalist comes along and say, oh, but that's only an illusion. Now, the argument in chapter six of my book is that you could never show it to the illusion except by presupposing it to be true. Because 
what would be the evidence that there's no downward causation, that our pains never make a difference to whether we scream or not? Well, you would have to find out that um, uh, um, whether we scream or not, uh, we had to find out whether a certain brain sequence will uh, produce pain, uh, uh, both when the, uh, we, we have a pain and when we don't. Yeah, sorry, produce screaming, both when we have a pain and when we don't. And how would you show that? Well, you would show that by, by showing that, um, <laughs> by finding cases where we, we have a pain and uh, it uh, uh, doesn't. Uh, and uh, by finding cases that, 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 that it happens, uh, both when we do have a pain and when we don't have a pain. But for that purpose, uh, we have to know, uh, the experimenter has to know who's checking this out when the subject is having a pain. And how is he going to know that? Well, the subject tells him he has a pain, but the subject can only convey information to him if the subject believes that he uh, intends the words to come out of his mouth and causes them to come out of his mouth. And so more generally, I mean, I have a general argument of that they couldn't, you know, whether um, uh, uh, any attempt to, to uh, any reliance on memory that this has happened would, would presuppose um, a downward causation from um, uh, the mental to the physical and so on. So uh, more generally, uh, you could only prove that the mental life didn't affect the physical life by some sort of demonstration, which presupposed that it did. Um, and since it seems that it does, and since the, nobody can show that it doesn't, uh, it's reasonable to suppose it does. And so it's reasonable to suppose, not merely that there's an upward uh, move from brain to mental life as obviously there is, but that there's a downward move. Now, that means that there are all sorts of laws governing this. Um, this brain event produces this mental event, that mental event produces this brain event. And this thing doesn't include those laws. So we must, there's no point in appealing to physics in this area. Uh, it's clearly got enormous deficiencies. And uh, let, uh, so leave it aside. Uh, my central arguments were uh, that um, given that uh, uh, I is an informative designator, um, I can know what I am talking about when I say that I can, I am thinking or I know this and so on. And um, it is manifest that this doesn't entail a contradiction. Um, <laughs> I can see that it's true. Um, and um, it is manifest also that I am the same person as the person earlier doesn't entail a contradiction um, because I know what I'm talking about. Uh, and um, that being the case, um, um, I can conceive, as Descartes uh, uh, said, uh, but, in fact, there isn't a physical world I've only dreaming. Uh, and um, I can see there's no contradiction in this. Uh, and therefore, um, it cannot be necessary for my existence. It can't be logically necessary. And therefore, it can't be metaphysically necessary because it's an informative designator. It can't be um, metaphysically necessary for my existence that I have a body. Um, and um, if we uh, alter the thought experiment slightly, uh, I can conceive not merely that there isn't a physical world and I don't have a body, but I can conceive that I have a body and I gradually lose control of it. Now, this could only be the case. Um, this requires, um, because I lose control of it, that having a soul is necessary. But it also requires that having a soul is sufficient because um, if, sorry, it shows that having a soul is sufficient because if I don't have a body, I still have. But it also shows that uh, having a soul is necessary because if I didn't have a soul at the first point, 
when I am in fact in control of my body, of them, um, uh, there wouldn't be any continuity between me when I have my body and me when I don't have my body, because at first there's the body and then there's the self. And therefore there wouldn't be the same person because uh, there would be no continuity. So in order for there to be the same person, something must continue. And if it isn't the body, then it must be the soul. So uh, it makes sense. There is no contradiction in supposing. And that shows that logically all that is necessary for my existence is a soul and not a body. We shared the good news, folks, with you. Now it's your decision to weigh up the evidence and make up your mind. If you love what you have listened to or watched on Majesty of Reason, consider subscribing to Majesty of Reason and share the video. Thank you. And thank you, Professor, for being with us. Thank you. Thank yeah. you for your interest.